Welcome to the Smart Money Tribe podcast. I'm your host, Arisa. I'm the founder of smartmoneyafrica.org, a financial education platform tailored to the African millennial woman. But I'm probably best known as the author of two best-selling personal finance books, The Smart Money Woman and The Smart Money Tribe. I love having money conversations that encourage African women to think bigger and become the chief financial officers of their own personal economies. This podcast is a weekly show that will focus on powerful conversations, stories, and practical lessons that teach African millennial women how to make money, keep money, and grow money. Hi, potties. <laughs> I'm trying that out, so you guys let me know on Instagram if you like it or not, potties. So I'm super excited about this week's episode because... I think that the world does not celebrate the brilliance in African women enough. We tend to focus on the beauty, the sexy, and all of that. And I was thinking I really wanted to start interviewing some really brilliant women, like truly smart women who are doing amazing things and showcasing their work and the way they think. I feel like we need more of that. My guest today is Dr. Chini Ogunro. Chini is one of those phenomenal minds. She's one of my favorite accounts to follow on Instagram because she's just so cool. Um, Chini is a healthcare systems operator whose research and work has explored innovative business models for healthcare delivery in growth economies particularly Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Chini has worked at Morgan Stanley, Verilon Partners, and she's provided long-term consultancy for the Nigerian Federal Ministry of Health, as well as multiple other development and partner organizations. Chini holds a, wait for it, PhD in health management from Harvard Business School, an MA in health administration from Cornell University and a bachelor's degree from Stanford University. So she's a brain, don't get it twisted. In this episode, we talk about building a business in the healthcare industry in Nigeria, negotiating compensation, building capacity, employer and employee relations, conversations she has about money with her husband, and so much more. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Hi, Chini. Hi, Arase. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the podcast, Um, finally. (laughs) No, of course. We've been, Chini's a very busy woman, balancing a lot of things, and it's been, you know, it's taken a while for us to schedule this time, but it was so important to me that Chini was on the podcast because I really want, you know, smart girls who are doing big things to come on and, you know, motivate us. So, yay, thank you. No, it's really my pleasure. Um, I don't even know if I can say I'm doing big things or anything like that, but I'm I'm more than happy to share my background, share my experiences, just see anything that might be useful for people. And yeah, let's 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 get everybody some knowledge on what career paths or what decisions might be useful for them. That's amazing. So guess what? Do you know Chini and I met on Instagram, right? Oh yeah. (laughs) I started following her and I think it may have been before I started small money or when I just started small money and I just remember thinking oh my god who is this girl like she was beautiful she was smart she went to Harvard I think you were doing your PhD at the time yeah I was still in school and I loved how you kind of balanced like you know career woman that you are and you know being married and being a mother and just watching that transition um over the years has been so amazing so yeah when we met in new york i was in super fangirl mode like oh my god i can't believe we're actually meeting in person when we had been following each other on instagram for for years so yeah instagram is such a great like networking tool but she and i somehow we haven't like developed our relationship we keep saying yeah we're going to meet up for lunch 
and dinner and it just never happens. It, it's but, hilarious because like even when we met in um in New York it was by accident because like I didn't know you were going to be at the gala and you didn't know I was going to be there. It was just kind of like we were both in the same place at the same time. And now that we're both like we know each other in Lagos, I think schedules like I'm here, you're there, everybody's all over the place. And then we bump into each other at the supermarkets and like we still haven't <laughs> gotten together. I think this is a good time to just kind of jump in and tell, you know, my audience, who is Chini Ogoro? What do you do? How did you come to be this badass woman that you are today? Oh, gosh, that was, that's such a loaded question. Um, who am I? It sounds, you know, it sounds so deep and like philosophical. Um, I would say I am, I don't know, I'm me. So I've always been very passionate about healthcare specifically, but also about like doing um, good work, right? From from quite a young age, I was born in Nigeria, lived in Nigeria until I was about nine, 10. I uh, moved to the US, as you can tell from my accent, and I went to um, pretty much every, all my schooling, all my educational stuff happened in the US. Um, and I ended up um, really focusing on healthcare, but on the business side of healthcare. So I would define myself as a um, healthcare system operator, but maybe not just health systems, but anything that has to do with improving the state of healthcare in lower middle income countries. Um, I would define myself as like a free spirit. I'm extra nerdy, yes, but at the same time, I just want to be myself. I want to be um, quirky, funny. I crack a lot of jokes. So yeah, <laughs> maybe that's not a good way to describe myself, but I'm just kind of, I, most important to me is being myself and authentically me. <laughs> so tell me, what was your first um, childhood memory when it comes to money? Oh, wow. That's, that's a good one. You know, I would actually have to say it has to do with how we moved from Nigeria to the U.S. So my family, my parents, my siblings and I, I have two older sisters and one younger brother. Um, we went from, I mean, I wouldn't say we were wealthy, but we were very comfortable in our life in in Nigeria. I'm, I'm from Anambra States. So I live mostly in Obosi, Enugu, a little bit in Portakot mm-hmm. when I lived in um when I lived in Nigeria. So to go from everything to be very comfortable, you know, like nice houses, nice cars, all of that, um, and just be thrown into I think we, we first landed in like a one bedroom apartment in the US. Uh it was yeah, you you really you really see as a young child, like the meaning of money and what it means from to go from having a very comfortable amount of money to not having much of it. Um, and that just kind of, you know, it slapped me in the face. I was like, wait, 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 what's, what's going on? Why, why don't we have as much as we used to? Um, so I would say that that's definitely my first very vivid memory of what it means um, to understand the meaning of money. How do you feel like you navigated that as a child? Um, How did it make you feel? So the beautiful thing about being relatively young, you know, that was like nine or 10 years old, is it it affects you, but it doesn't necessarily affect you because you're so young. You focus on having fun. You focus on knowing that you have your siblings around you. Um, You try to focus on the positivity. So it didn't, I wouldn't say that it made me feel bad. It was just very... Um, it was just a very pronounced difference. Uh, but our parents would talk to us about um, the changes that were taking place because uh, my parents, my mom especially, oh my gosh, my mom is an especially um, ambitious woman, right? So for her, it was like, okay, we may be here right now, but give me like five years time and we'll be living in a house. So she she particularly worked her butt off um, and my parents were just able to um, put their head down. And so we moved quite a lot. We moved from that apartment to another apartment to another apartment. And literally within the span of a few years, um, we, we were living in a house and then we eventually lived in quite a big house with a pool and a tennis court and the whole thing. Um, so I, I'm, I'm telling you, <laughs> um, you, you really see like the benefit of hard work. We see the financial benefit of hard work um, in a short amount of time and what really focusing on your goals um, can be. And, and also being financially prudent, right? Because if you're trying to go from 
um, I won't say nothing, but from having very little means to having a lot, you have to be quite intelligent and deliberate with how you spend money. Yeah, I think that's amazing. Like, I definitely love um, asking this question because I think it's interesting to kind of compare and contrast the way that we dealt with money um, issues when we were kids and how our parents handled it as compared to how we deal with it with our kids now, right? So there are times where I find myself like thinking, hmm, am I doing this with the core in the right way? Am I having this conversation about needs versus wants mm-hmm. and explaining about limited resources in the right way? Yeah. Or am I getting to a point where I'm sharing too much of our problem <laughs> with a child, right? Yeah. Because one thing like, I feel like I came to appreciate when I got older was the money conversations that my parents had with us when we're growing up. So things like now I I'm 35 years old. I went to secondary school when I was 10. Right. Yeah. And I still know what my first term school fees was. It was 55,600. Wow. Why do I know it? Because my, my parents, you know, they never let me forget that, going to a private school like Ignatian was a sacrifice for them. So my dad had his friends asking him, I don't understand, why are you sending a girl to a private school and paying this kind of money? Why can't she just go to QC? Why can't she just go to like a federal government school? You know, but my parents really believed in education, but they wouldn't just let us have things just for having a sake. Like it would be, listen, you're going to go to this school. It's a privilege. Don't go there and forget yourself and be thinking that you're like everybody else. You ain't got it. So you better work hard for, for, you know, what you have to get good grades so that we can justify like this expense. And I think those conversations that are important and I especially love what you said about your, your mom being like, you know what, but give me five years. It sounds like me as the Cora. I'm like, what do you want to do for the summer? Let's plan what we're doing this summer. And then we plan this elaborate thing. And then, you know, every day she's asking, mommy, have you made money? Mommy, are we, are we, you know, are we going to, have you reached your goal? Are we going to get there? So are we going to like get to the best case scenario? It's, and it's hilarious, right? But, I think that's amazing. Having that level of transparency with a child um, gets them to understand that it's not just it's not just that money grows on trees and you can have all these fantastic trips and experiences. It's that you have to put in the work and you have to be um, intelligent about how you use and save money in order to do it. So I really, honestly, I really applaud you for that because the core is going to have a, I mean, of course, you're her mother, so she's going to have a great <laughs> of, of her finances. I hope so. I really hope so. Um, so. Let's talk about your career, kind of like your education Mm -hmm. and your career progression, right? So you went to some very amazing Ivy League schools and then you came back to Nigeria and started taking on some really big projects. So tell us a little bit about that. Ooh, okay, that's a lot to talk about. Um, so in high school, I mean, let, let me start with, it, it always comes back to family. My uh, my parents, since they left Nigeria, right, their whole thing to us, their children was, um, we left that country so that our kids could have the best possible opportunities in the entire world. Uh, my mom always says, my kids won't get to Harvard if we're just sitting around in Nigeria. And I mean, maybe it's not true today, but I think um, to a large extent, she had a vision for what she wanted for her children. My dad was a, m- a much more relaxed, but he also had the same type of, um, uh, I would say, ambition for his kids. So <laughs> once we got to the U.S., man, like most Nigerian parents, they didn't play with the grades. <laughs> but my parents were interesting in the way they they described, I would say, education to us. Um, you could do, they were very permissive in the sense that you could do almost anything you wanted as long as your grades were fine. So if you want to go and, um, for example, since I'm a runner, if you want to do track, fine, you can do track as long as your grades are good. If you want to do arts and crafts, if you want to go to your friend's house, like they were more or less, sure, you can do anything in the world that you want to do as long as your grades are good. Exactly. So the second my grades would slip up, 
every every freedom was stopped. So you had a huge incentive to always do well in um, in school. So I went to Stanford because I liked that it was an academic and an athletic institution. So it was just right for my personality. Um, and while I was there, I was I really developed my love for healthcare management. Um, I decided to do research at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. I also did a lot of research at the um, Stanford Medical School. So I was always mixing healthcare and business. Like I would take human biology courses, but I'd also take economics courses. I would take international relations courses, but I'd also take like, you know, just to have a well-rounded experience of both the healthcare part, not to be a medical doctor, but to know the healthcare um, and also to have the business part. So then my master's, I went into healthcare management um, at Cornell. So I went from California to upstate New York, where it was very cold, um, but it was all centered around healthcare management. How do you become a better healthcare administrator? How do you make sure that you know how to operate hospitals and clinics, but really developing business models for healthcare? Um, and it was, it was specifically at my, like while I was doing my PhD at Harvard, that I decided um, this is really the right thing for me in terms of my long term career. Yeah, that is so incredible because. Most people either go to school and say, oh, I want to be a doctor or they be, go to school and say, I want to be a business person. But I've never seen it. I don't see it very often where those two things are um, combined. And, you know, in Africa, we, we have that issue here where the healthcare system is a huge mess. Yeah. And uh, and it's because most, you know, you find a lot of doctors who are really great at, you know, improving themselves professionally and, you know, are, are as good as their counterparts in America or England. But the way that they run the business of the hospital is lacking, like in comparison. So I know you've done a lot of work um, in the healthcare system in Africa. So do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, your decision to move here and do some work here yeah so it was it was really um maybe i'll call it a privilege of being the third child uh my my oldest sister she's a surgeon she's a retinal surgeon went to all the top schools and she practices in the upper east side of new york so like you know she already made my parents proud my other sister she's a radiation oncologist and she leads um one of the top like U.S. Uh, hospital systems um, departments for like international radiation oncology. So she's already, they've already fulfilled the African parents dream of like being the good children. Yeah. So since this, I was already, um, I won't say problematic, but since I was already like an interesting free spirit, all I had to give my parents was more like a plan. This is what I plan to do. And this is my interest. I won't lie. When, when I told them that I, you know, I really want to go back to Nigeria or just like do more work in Africa. It was like, ah, Chini, we ran away from that place. Why are you going back? Like, what's wrong with you? And so it was like, what are you doing? Like, what are you really trying to do? But for me, um, you know, it's it's really about what motivates you as an individual. And I've never, I've never really been motivated by just pure money. I think that money has to be taken care of, right? So I need to ha have my basics covered. I need to be able to afford decent housing, a roof over my head, food in my stomach, um, nice clothes on my back. But beyond that, like I've never been one who's gingered by um, showing off money. My My longer term aspirations have always been in terms of like, helping people and making sure people are alive. So I think the way I think <laughs> about it, uh, no, honestly, the way I think about it, really, when, you know, when I die and ideally go to heaven, Jesus, please take me to heaven. When I die and ideally go to heaven, um, God is going to ask me a few questions and he's going to say like, okay, Chini, I gave you all these talents. What have you done with your talents? And I don't want to be like, oh, look at the Range Rover and look at the car and all that stuff because like, I'm not going to be able to take that with me. Not to say that those things are bad. You know, having those things are not bad at all. And if you see me driving anything or having a nice house, I, like I'm not criticizing that, but I want to make sure that I'm able to say, you know, my time on earth was spent making sure that this additional 200,000, 2 million, 20 million people were able to have good lives and were able to um, 
experience the world in a better way because of my life and my work. So that's that's, that's so amazing. Because I think that people these days, like they're not thinking enough about legacy, mm-hmm. right? Um, they're not thinking enough about, you know, what we're leaving in this world, like when we go and you're right, like no one is going to remember what car you drove or what kind of house you lived in or how many, you know, Chanel bags you had. They're going to remember how you made people feel. They're going to remember the impact that your work um, had on others. You know, what are we being recognized for? What are we, you know, what we, what are we being financially successful for? Like, who are we helping? Um, what problems are we solving? So I think it's definitely um, an important um, conversation, legacy. Yes. Completely agreed. Yeah, I know you have your pet peeves about that as well, like the the, the social media um, showing off and all of that. Yeah, I so it's kind of like I have a love hate relationship with social media. I think it's great because um, you know I'm I'm quite an introvert. I like I'm a homebody. I don't really socialize that often in terms of in person talking to people. So social media, Instagram, um, Twitter, all of those things are a way to connect with others in the world. And just like, it's great to find people who have the same interests or to have different sorts of like conversations. But at the same time, I just, I see it's being much like you said, it's very skewed in one direction. And of course, you know, I, I sometimes make the arguments, well, social media, it is what you make of it. It's about the people you follow and the sort of um, content that you want to take in. But the vast majority of the content on many social media platforms are rather, um, they're rather, I would say, vapid and shallow. Uh, and I, I, I think it's important to, to show different types of uh, people and personalities and to have a bit of a balance, right? But unfortunately, especially for, for young people and, and young girls in particular, if the majority of what they see is kind of like, um, you know, the, the the Instagram baddies, the the surgery outs, um, luxury, everything, private jets trying to show off sort of thing. Again, nothing wrong with the luxuries of the world. If you see me on a PJ and you you, you bring up this conversation, I thought she didn't like PJs. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with those things, but I think that the focus on solely those things just for the heck of um, trying to oppress other people or to show off how great of a human being you are based on money is is the wrong way to go about it. So I, I like, you know, I like um I like Instagram accounts like yours that are able to show different perspectives to get people to think in a different in, in a different way that's equally as important as as you know the ass shaking videos of the world. That, that's just how I feel. You know one thing I do I love about you is that I feel like you're well rounded and I love to see that. Like so you're smart you showcase and share like your knowledge and your experiences and your stories, but then you also showcase, yes, I'm a baddie in my own right as well. Like I look good. (laughs) I got it. I like music. I like to have fun as well. I'm not serious, serious all the time. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. Um, I work out. Like I, I like, you know, the balance because I think that African women tend to be put in boxes. It is either you're yeah. a smart girl and you don't get to go clubbing. You don't get to go out and have drinks with your friends. And, or you're the, <laughs> or it's the other end of the spectrum where you, if you're beautiful and you're, and you like fashion, then you don't get to be smart as well. But I feel like it's important for you to showcase like you know your story more and yourself more because you're inspiring like young girls to see that there are other ways because like you said yeah there's nothing wrong you know if if luxury is what you like and what you you're passionate about fantastic but we just need more voices like we need to showcase more how to be a baddie in other ways (laughs) i feel like social media is a double-edged sword because as much as You know, I I try to sometimes put out content that's intellectual or helpful for people. Um, I'll get all these if I if one day I'm posting about like, oh, this is a really great book that I read. And the next day you see me like shaking my ass on my husband. People are like, oh, my God, like, how could she do that? What is this? And I'm like, ah. It's not, it's not by force. You can, one, one doesn't mean you can't do the other. I love it. So let's get back to the money, right? That's so so cool. decide that you are, <laughs> you're moving back and you want to do this healthcare stuff. 
And I can imagine that it's very capital intensive because hospitals um, here, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. So how did you, do you want to walk us through how you raise money to execute your idea? I'll talk about like the planting of the seeds, um, the actual fundraising process, and then like the the post fundraise execution process. Um, a lot of people think that so investments or fundraising in general is very um, is, is male dominated and it's particularly like white male dominated. So anybody who's outside of Silicon Valley or outside of those circles in New York, um, if you go to if you look at the numbers, um, women, especially black women, make up a very, very small percentage of people who are able to get um, funding. And even in my early experience, when I was fundraising by myself, um, I was actually pregnant at the time. And it just, I, you know, I was naive. I was like, oh, I'm smart and I'm hardworking and my model makes sense. So why shouldn't they give me money? Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm walking in a black woman with a big belly and everybody's just <laughs> like, this is, this is just not going to happen. So as many conversations as I had that like went very far, ultimately I didn't get funding on my own. So I'll talk about two types of funding. There was the donor funding that I received um, several grants worth hundreds of thousands of dollars before I ever did any like formal um, fundraising for business. And those were very, very helpful, but I didn't realize how helpful they were at the time. Um, so organizations like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, a number of different donors who give those sorts of grants. I didn't, I, I didn't realize how powerful it was that I, I received those grants at the time that I received them. Cause I was, I'll be honest, I was just naive and I was used to winning, right? Cause I was still in school. <laughs> A lot of the grants I got were for like research, um, but business related research. And I had always, I had never, I really had never been rejected in any way. So getting the grants was like, okay, great. 600,000, fantastic, I deserve it. Um, So then when I started fundraising by myself and it was just like, no, (laughs) it it bruised my ego. Yeah, because I I really wasn't used to that um so formally right do you feel like it messed with your confidence like when you started to get rejections Mm -hmm. like do you feel like it messed with your confidence maybe maybe for a few days but not not for anything much longer than that um because really and truly I, i feel as though i was so passionate about the model and and i knew though i knew that i knew my work um and it was just a matter of time before somebody would actually say yes um, and and take the risk. And I didn't even feel like it was a risk. I was just, I think I was super, um, either super young and naive or super confident in myself and my capabilities. And just knowing the fact that not many people, very maybe a handful of people in the world um, had the unique knowledge and ability to execute that I did. Um, but, but I chalked a lot of the rejections up to, man, like I shouldn't have done this while I was pregnant. I didn't realize how, having such like a big prominent pregnant belly made a difference in the minds of people about your abilities. Maybe if I hadn't been pregnant and I had still gotten rejected that I would feel like, oh, okay, it was me. Like I'm, I'm, I'm in my confidence, but I was like, ah, it's okay. They don't even realize that I can still do this, whether I have one, two, 10 children, that type of thing. It's nice. I feel like it's nice that that gets to be part of your story that pregnant women are not disabled. They can work, you know, hard too. But I'll be honest, though. I'll be very honest. I was also quite naive because um, those rejections, they were right. Like when when I did give birth um, and I was mm. trying to do a million things along with like run the business and, and take care of the child, I, w- I was overwhelmed. I would not have been able to um, run as fast as possible or do the things that I imagined I would have been able to do if I had mm. raised the funds at, at that time. Mm. Yeah. So mm. I always say like God's timing is the best. He knows what's meant for you. Um, he knows when you're supposed to do certain things. So it wasn't, it ultimately worked out for the best. So basically you were raising money. You, is it, is it correct to say that you ha- you raised money um, in the Western world and for Africa. Yes. Okay. So walk me through your the rejections, the point at which you you know you got your last rejection and to when you actually got your first yes. So when I when when the first yes really happened, um I wouldn't even say necessarily fully because of me. It was through a relationship with my former business partner. 
um, which was which was great because I was able to kind of I was very much able to sit back and focus on growing the business as opposed to worrying too much about investment relationships. Mm-hmm. And that was that I would say that was really beneficial and it's it worked out well for the time period it was meant to work out well. That's amazing. So you had this fantastic idea to sort out healthcare, um, I guess globally, but you started in Africa. Yeah. What would you say the biggest challenges were setting up a business um, in the healthcare industry in Africa, particularly? Because I can imagine that that would come with its own particular challenges. So there are a number of different uh, peculiarities to the healthcare sector. Um, I think overall for all businesses in Africa, especially in Nigeria, just you know finding capital, getting capital, raising capital is difficult. Uh, so let's set, let's set the capital issue aside like and acknowledge, acknowledge that that's a really, really difficult thing to do. Um, for any business in in African in the African setting, we tend to have our biggest constraint be human human capital. So not financial capital, but human capital. Having the people that you need to get the job done. Yeah, that could be the ideas, yeah. Yes. And that and that's I mean that's multifaceted, right? Because first you have the issue of education on the continent. Our educational institutions um, are not necessarily where they need to be in order to have uh, a steady pipeline of um, not simply graduates, but people who are actually able to do the job that is required of them. Um, so you end up taking on that responsibility internally. Now with healthcare, you have a double problem because it's not simply you don't have enough people to do the job, but you need people who have, um, for example, specialized skills and knowledge. You need doctors, you need nurses, you need other sorts of healthcare frontline workers who know about healthcare, who know about providing care. If they're not educated to the standard that you need in their schools or institutions, then you have to take on essentially the role of providing continued medical education. And that is costly. So it's training the people, it's teaching them consistently about what they need to do. Um, and and it's ensuring that uh, you also create your own pipeline of workers. Um, so one thing that I started really looking when we were about two years in was um, was using a digital platform, using technology to create the pipeline of people. Um, because we knew that we wouldn't be able to get the right um, medical officers, the right doctors um, right off the bat. So how do we make sure that for every single role, from the people who are working administrative at the front desk, um, to the to the janitors, to the um, accounting people who are who are working um, like the the cashier and things like that. So not just the not just the the um, healthcare providers, but everybody throughout the entire organization. How do we make sure that they're getting the right training? So we started looking at digital platforms and digital solutions. How do you create modules for each person? Um, let's say that somebody named Christina is working in the facility. Okay, Christina's role is X, Y, Z. For everybody whose role is X, Y, Z, this is what they need to be trained on. And they all have it. And even I would be able to go in and see how they done their training modules for the month, for the quarter, for the year. Um, so that sort of thing was... That's I, amazing. Yeah, that's it's like a workaround for trying to make sure that you have the right people on your team doing the right work. That's amazing because that's even a whole business idea on its own because I've been in situations where you interview someone for a job and they say and on their CV it says um they studied computer science and you find out the person has never seen an actual computer before and they can't use Word, they can't use Excel. Um, so it's really it's a very difficult, you know, terrain um, to navigate. So well done, because I can't even imagine how much work would have been gone into creating those kind of modules for the people who work for you. So you're not only solving this problem for yourself, but you're potentially solving it for a lot of other, like, um, businesses. That is... Fantastic. But what would you say um, in your own career progression, how have you been able to navigate um, things like promotions and compensation? Because I find that that's a big challenge Mm -hmm. for many 
not just people, but I feel like for women, yeah. it's, it's always a difficult ask. You're ready to do the work. Um, you're probably passionate about what you do. But when it comes to asking for money, yeah. when it comes to saying, this is my worth, by you know whether it's your salary or you know work that you're negotiating to do for a client I find that many women shy away from charging or just fearful of charging yeah I I fully agree and I I am not I am not immune to that I have made many mistakes around um compensation in in the past and it's it's really detrimental for your career and also your mindset um i found my posi- myself in the position actually multiple times of being the most value adding person the person who has the most knowledge the most experience the most um you know the most relevant background for a given position or task or or project. Um, And some guy, some man usually will decide that maybe not just because he's a man, but because he has more, you know, he's louder, he's more um, showy, he's able to sell himself as being this, this and that, but he actually doesn't have anything to back it up, um, that he'll now be like, oh, okay, Um, he'll use my profile and he'll go around and raise millions of dollars using my profile or my resume and saying, okay, this person is going to be on my team to do the job. But at the end of the day, I'm the one doing the majority of the work. And um, to be honest, especially when I was young and naive, like in my 20s, I was I was just happy to do the work. It's, it's difficult when you enjoy the work itself um, to really have that money conversation. So I really enjoyed the work. I really enjoyed learning. I really enjoyed having an impact. Ah, but after some time, you're just looking at the whole thing like, wait a minute, wait a second. What am I working for? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. What am it, I working for? It's, it's not even, honestly, for me, it wasn't even, um, I need more money per se. It was the lack of fairness, right? The lack of equity. It's like, I'm doing all of this stuff and this other person is literally not doing anything at all. So why mm-hmm. do you feel like they're entitled to multiples of what it is that I am receiving? And that's what really triggered me more than anything else. It wasn't like, because again, I'm not really like a money. Do you see even your internal sort of like thought process is, it's not really about the m- money for me. A man would never say that. I, I know. It is about the money. I don't know why we shy away from saying this as Africans, as um, as women, but I think that we need to start owning it. Nobody should be working for free. <laughs> like we, we should be passionate about what we do. We should be connected to our purpose. But we should not be shy about saying this is my value. Exactly. We should not be shy about saying I don't want to work for twenty years and look back and ask myself, hold on, what was I working for? Because I have no assets. I have no cash flow. Thank you. And I think there's so many talented you know, brilliant women who have worked really hard but have nothing to show for it at the end. Million reasons, but one of those reasons is they always say, oh, it's not really about money for me. It's just, you know, I'm very passionate about doing this. And I feel like the more, when we start owning it, we, co- we command more respect. P- men shouldn't feel comfortable saying, um what is because i've got to ask this what do i need the money for so what i was speaking about was that it's different when you truly enjoy the work itself and it's technically stuff that you would do for free and i agree with you 100 percent. i really had to get out of that mindset when i was like oh but you know i love the work i'm doing this and that to realizing that the way the market perceives you um it's been on, like the way the market values you is really based on like your salary and your compensation package as though that's the value you actually bring to the table. So when I started looking at it like, oh, they actually value this person more than me based on what they're paying him um, when I am the really valuable person. And, and I was just like, that's absolutely wrong. Like absolutely wrong. Yeah. You're not bringing much more value. You better pay me. So honestly, I started... <laughs> 
I started speaking up about it. I was, I, there was, there was an organization that I left. I was just like, you know what? F this. You, you really don't know half as much as I do. Why am I bringing in all these like donor funds and grants and millions of dollars for you when I could do this on my own? And I just left. Exactly. And the, the guy was mad though. Like to this day, he'll probably walk around saying terrible stuff like Chini is this, Chini is that. <laughs> Can you imagine me? I'm just like looking at him. I don't care, dude. I don't care. You knew what you were doing. You did it on purpose because you felt like since I was a woman, I wasn't going to stick up for myself. And I, I realized a number of people do that very intentionally. Um, they particularly mm. for women who um, who are, let's say, who have families, who are providers for their families or bring in significant income for their family. And they realize that they can kind of box these women in using like the salary thing and making sure that she doesn't ask for too much or she's put in her place. But then when you actually have the nerve to do more and be like, no, 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 that's not how much you're going to give. All of a sudden, like, can you imagine she asked for this and this and that? And I'm like, I can't imagine because you were getting multiples on that. So why should you have a problem paying the, the person, the people who are actually providing value? It's terrible. So you, have- you know what really bugs me is how we've internalized um, this thing so much that me- people, and I won't just say just men, like, especially mm-hmm. in Africa, I feel like people feel so comfortable like saying things like what do you need the money for at the end of the day so in your case you're saying oh you she has a family there are cases where they'll say but you are single oh you don't have you don't have a family to provide for so why do you need this much money are you joking why is it like i do the same amount of work (laughs) as this next person and then you think that because he's a man Mm -mm. and he has a family he's entitled to more money than me when we're doing the same amount of work and we've normalized that and then we started to vilify women who ask for more i've even been in situations where i will ask i we've signed a contract right Mm -hmm. this is in nigeria we've signed a contract we've agreed this is how much you're going to pay me and then i do the work and then when it's time to pay me their stories it's mm. like, are you joking? They're, and they start saying, um, well, you know, we're going to have to negotiate because I'm like, you signed a contract. Oh, I can't remember signing it. And I keep thinking, would they do this to a man? Would they do this to a guy? I wouldn't. Would I have to come and start, you know, playing nice and, and smiling and being like, please, can you just pay me my money? This type of thing, it changes you. Because like I've seen, I've felt myself change over the years, especially this year. Um, it changes your, your attitude and your behavior because you slowly realize that, particularly because you're a woman, you're going to have to be much more cut and dry about it. There's, there's people... Like I used to be nice. I shouldn't say used to be, but I would say I'm naturally a nice person. Um, but when people take the piss so frequently, you just have to change your approach and be like, listen, you can call me whatever you want. I actually do not care. You're going to treat me with respect and you're going to pay me how much I'm valued. And you're, you're of course, not going to go back on a contract. Um, at least you're not going to go down. But if I'm adding more value, then we should be able to renegotiate it up. And then when you're gaslighting you acting like you are you are the one acting like a bitch. If you paid me my money when you were supposed to pay it without all this mess, then you won't have had to see this other side of me. Exactly. Exactly. Like I I think these conversations need to be had and likely to be had at like an um to be to be obvious to women who are younger and younger. I mean, I mean, not just women, both men and women, but I think women experience this disproportionately. And I wish that somebody had sat my younger self down, like in my early twenties and been like, Hey, Chinny, um, this type of thing is going to happen in this situation. You need to do it like this. And it was only when I became more vocal about it, I started talking to um, mentors and being like, can you imagine this person did X, Y, and Z? And they're like, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's difficult because you're really taking a risk. And I understand why so many people don't speak up about getting screwed in terms mm. of how much they're getting paid. Because particularly like, you know, in a setting where there are a limited number of jobs for a large number of working people in the population, you you feel some type of way like, oh, okay, do I even deserve more when other people don't have jobs? But you do, you deserve mm. it. You ask for it and you should be pushing yourself to ask for it. And I was, I was actually surprised because the number of, um, 
I've always been an advocate for, for paying people more in every single role I've had. Mm-hmm. I've always been like, okay, this person has added value in the last one year. Let's give them a raise. Yeah. This person has done this. Oh, okay. This person has outgrown that position. They need to get a new position, a new title with more. And people are always, each and every time I've done that, people are shocked to have someone um, go to bat for them or somebody um, exactly. kind of, they say, you didn't have to dash me. This. Oh, I didn't dash you for it. It's going to be dashing you the money. You worked for it. You you deserve it. Yeah. You be asking for these sorts of things in any position. But we also have to normalize people speaking up for other people in rooms that they're not in, right? Yeah. Yes. And I think women especially, like we need to, not just for our friendship circles, but just even like what you're saying in the workplace. When you notice that another woman is being underpaid, speak up yes tell her yeah speak for her like these things go a really really long way um and i just think that in general like we need to be bolder about our asks and not as you know shy about it and we need to remove that thing from our internal script where we're saying no it's not about the money money is only something that gives you choices right Mm -hmm. It's just a tool that helps you to live, you know, the life that you want to live. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, you know, for access to that tool, you need to be able to create value. So you should be ap- appropriately, you know, compensated for the value that you put out. Which brings me to my next question. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> what did you do with your first paycheck? Whoa. Did you do anything fun? My first <laughs> paycheck ever in life. I think I was like 16. Uh, my first job was at a bagel store in Long Island. So, I, you know, I'm from Long Island. My first job was making bagels and sandwiches and things like that and cream cheese. My first paycheck went to pay bills. <laughs> I, I, I can't lie. Um, my first paycheck went to pay bills. Well, you know, I started, I, I, I had opened an account um, and I had some credit. So I had my debit card and my credit card and I, and I had some credit. And, you know, I think this was my my parents' way of teaching me how to be responsible with money. And I just started spending on a credit card. I don't even think it was anything astronomical, but I ended up with like $300 um, on my credit card that I was like, well, I, I don't have any money to pay this back. Ah, the way I worked to pay, that back, pay, pay back that $300. But the funny thing is, once I paid everything back and I started just like having additional cash, it got, it got a bit addictive because it's like, okay, so you mean to tell me I can work more hours and I'll make more money and I'll have more available cash. And so you just, you know, you just start going at it. Anytime somebody was sick, I'll be like, I'll work. Anytime somebody was, um, they wanted to go off for the weekend, I was like, no problem. I'll take your hours. It didn't, it didn't mean anything to me to work 12 hours at a time because I was like, it just means more cash in the bank. So yeah, my first bill. my first bills went to pay off debts. I hate debt so much. Like I hate credit card debt. I hate school debt, like any sort of debt, loans, that type of thing. I'm so averse to it. It needs to be gone within a matter of like a couple of months. You know that I wish someone told me that thing about credit cards, because (laughs) when I first um, moved to England, when I first went to university, I remember my first year after Freshers Week, they sent us, like after we opened accounts and stuff, they sent me this credit card that had like something like 500 pounds or between 250 pounds and 500 pounds credit on it and in my head it was free money I was like wow these people like why are they just offering me free money and I used it to shop and all of that and then when I saw the bill at the end of the month I was like my parents are actually going to kill me (laughs) they're actually going to kill me but it was my first lesson in I guess credit card because we don't really have that kind of credit in Nigeria at least Mm -hmm. at the time we didn't so it was like a new like thing for me but we need to teach kids about the responsibility before you know they take on um credit card definitely definitely so what kind of money conversations did you have with your husband before um you got married and what advice do you have couples who you know, maybe need tips on how to manage the family's finances. You know, it's funny because we actually come from 
very different family cultures and not not many people acknowledge this like you when you're when you're younger before you get married or before you get into serious relationships i think we're all colored by our own internal family dynamics so for me my family is very um i come from a family of like um one, two, like four women, two men. So my my dad and my brother, and then my two sisters and my and my mom. My mom is a very big personality. Like the bigger the better. Everything, you know. The girls are very talkative, very loud. We just had a very, um, we have a very open family. Like everybody's hugging, everyone's kissing, say I love you all the time. That type of family dynamics. Um, and but like. It's also been colored by the fact that my mom, she's she's a she's a doctor and she's been a doctor like her whole life. So a lot of her identity is the fact that she's a doctor and she works hard and she loves her work. So we've always seen our mom go to work. We've seen our dad go to work. We've always seen both parents going to work. Um, but my husband's family is quite different from that. So for him, from his perspective, like the man is very much the provider of the household um, and and. Mom happened to stay home and raise the children, um, which is also like very meaningful work. So when we got together, um, he, so my husband actually was good friends with my sisters before he ever met me because I was out in California most of the time. So he knew my family dynamics in terms of like all the women work and the women are very loud, we're very talkative, we're very mm-hmm. like, very, you know, Personal. yeah. And energetic. So he knew that. Um, but I think knowing it theoretically is different from like <laughs> applying it inside the family. So um, when we first got together, we had money conversations. He's like, yeah, OK. So um, his assumption, not that it was bad, it was just that the guy tends to provide a lot. And I was like, wait a second, wait a, wait a second. Yeah. We're talking about like, what is <laughs> like, it's not mm-hmm. it's not your money and my money it's our money. Like, Whoever's accounts the money happens to be in, wherever the money happens to be, it's both of our money together. Like it doesn't make sense for me to think as okay if we're going to buy um, a a house or a piece of, or a property and the money is only coming from you. That wouldn't make sense. Well, couldn't we buy a property that's twice as large if the money also comes from me? Um, so he's 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 always been. Like incredibly supportive of my career, he he goes into like his networks. He makes those connections. Anything that he finds interesting, he sends to me. He teaches me a lot about like um, private equity and even like raising finance and things like that. So it's just been I don't know. He's just a really girl. He sounds like Shola in my book. (laughs) He sounds like Shola. We're still going to have to scrap the Sierra prayer. We're still going to have to be doing a Chini prayer. Okay, so my final two questions. So first, you're, you know, you are successful um, in your career. You're successful in your marriage. You've built quite a great life for yourself. So what skills would you say that you had to, that you had to build or you had to improve um, to basically be successful? Um, so on the on the academic slash work slash career side, um, first and foremost, I always tell people this is really discipline, just the discipline to um, put your head down and focus and do what you need to get it done. Um, I, I say that part of my discipline came from the fact that I was an athlete for so long and, you know, you put your body through a lot of pain, ideally in order to achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve, but you're also on a very strict schedule to get everything done. Um, so for me, it was discipline, but it was also the, the the ability to adapt. And I know that a lot of people already know that, but it's not simply like, okay, this is how the world has changed now and let me try and adapt. But it's looking down the road to see what is actually going to happen in the future. Um, so we're now in how many months in, like I think five, six months into the whole COVID-19 thing. But in month two, I started looking around and I was like, man, this this COVID situation worldwide is not going to be good. Um, so I started following a lot of like economic assessments of what the world will look like and what different countries are going to look like down the line. And I, I, I had conversations with like my family members and my husband and I was like, you know what? Um, I need to change my approach to my career because the world is going to change very rapidly due to COVID. So I took a, a number of months to like, one, double down on um, the hard skills, right? So my background is in 
statistical analysis and strategy and technology and operations management. So I just, I took myself back to school. I did a number of Coursera courses, making sure that I was like on top of my in terms of data science, in terms of um, statistical analysis and things like that. Um, but I also like doubled down on that touching base with my contacts and just letting them know, having them have an update on where it is that I am in life and the things that I'm thinking of doing. Um, and that has really brought about a number of different opportunities that I wouldn't otherwise have had if I hadn't been like, I know the world is going to change very soon. Let me be ahead of the curve in terms of those changes. So first for like work and, and school and career um, is the, the discipline, but also the ability, well, the ability to adapt to changes and to look down the line and see those changes but then the discipline to make the to take the actions that you need in order to implement those changes. But then for my personal life, <laughs> um, for my personal life in terms of like relationships and stuff, right? So again, pandemic, everybody is quarantining and social distancing and all that stuff. So um, maybe like the first two and a half months of this year, literally from the 1st of January to like the middle of March, my husband and I, we were not, I don't think we were on the same continents very frequently. I would be in like South Africa, he would be in Europe, I would be in New York, and he'd be in Nigeria. And like we were just traveling a lot and trying to get a lot done. And then all of a sudden, we're now like under the same roof with the kids all the time. I think that to be resilient and to do the kind of work that uh -huh. you um, do, you probably have to be stubborn. Like you probably, you have to be stubborn. You have to you know, not take no for an answer. You have to keep, like, doing things, even if it looks crazy to everybody. So I can imagine that that would be a very huge part so, of it. Like, it's beneficial in some ways, but in other ways, like, when... When I would be thinking through something or I'd, I'd want to take a particular course of action and he's like, well, I've been looking at what you want to do and do you think it might be better to do it blah, blah, blah way? Like I would listen, I realized I would listen to him, but at the end of the day, I'd be like, mm, no, the way I want to do it is probably better. And I, you know, after some feedback, I would, I would then like go off to by myself and marinate for a few hours and then I'll come back to him and be like, you know what? You are right. You are hundred percent right. I should do it that way. <laughs> oh my god I love it because it just shows how self-aware you are because none of us are perfect but I think it's important for us to continuously look at ourselves think about you know our areas of strengths our areas of weaknesses and how we can improve you know on our areas of weaknesses so it's amazing so Chini if you lottery for a million dollars for one million dollars <laughs> How you spend it? How you? I'm embarrassed because my first thought was only one million. <laughs> I love it. Um, Think big. Think one million. Big. I would probably um, half of it would be so like five hundred million to buy some sort of rental property, right? Like something that you can buy and you rent out to tenants, and um, over time, it likely pays for itself. Uh, Maybe three hundred thousand dollars would probably just go into not savings, but like um some sort of uh what well, dollar denominated um accounts that just gives you the the market return, right? So I'm not looking for anything beyond. I'm, I'll be conservative in that way. I'm not looking for like some um venture capital sort of. Ooh, I want thirty percent return or anything. No, just give me, just give me the, the a basic return over the next however many years. Um, I'll probably put three hundred thousand into that. Uh, what's that left? Two hundred thousand, a hundred thousand into something for like the kids, and then a hundred thousand to just spend for fun. Maybe like um, luxury stuff, like vacation, or I don't know, just something fun. But that's probably what I would do with that. So what? amazing talking to you, Chini. Um, this is so. This was brilliant. I hope the audience enjoys it um as much as i do. Yeah, thank you for thank having you so me. much it's a lot of fun and time. thank you everybody for listening yay thank you Jimmy. thank you for listening to this episode of the smart money tribe podcast i hope you enjoyed it i'm super excited about creating financial content for african millennial women who want to live a fabulous life but also want to learn how to find the balance between spending on their lifestyle needs and building assets that could protect their financial futures. Mm -hmm.